I am new to the University of Utah, but in these short nine months, I have come to appreciate just how wonderful our faculty are and how many superstars we really have. Part of our real strengths, I think, really center around the ability to take fr science from the bench to the bedside, and that's what our whole personalized medicine, personalized healthcare initiative is about. Today, we are going to be treated to presentations from a number of our star faculty. Don't get too nervous because they're all very short presentations. Um, so we, we will have time for questions and you'll still, we'll still finish it at a good time. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be able to turn over the, uh, the emceeing of this event to Dean Lee. He has really organized this event and is going to be running the show tonight and then I'll come back and close with just a few comments at the very end. So in the spirit of this, Dean is going to introduce all of our speakers, but I just wanted to take one quick moment to introduce Dean to you. So Dean Lee, and that's his real name. So w when we sit next to each other, sometimes it's confusing because, you know, somebody will say, Dr. Lee, Dean Lee, and we both jump up. So, <laughs> so Dean grew up on the south side of Chicago in the Hyde Park, Kenwood area. And he, as he likes to, as he's told us, he went to the school that the Obamas wouldn't send their kids to. He received his BA from the University of Chicago and his MD, PhD in cancer biology and clinical training in internal medicine and cardiology, all at Washington University in St. Louis. Dean moved his family to the University of Utah in 1994 to train in human genetics. As you know, we have some of the world's leaders in human genetics, including Mario Capecchi. And he stayed on at Utah and is presently the H.A. and Edna Benning Endowed Professor of Cardiology and Human Genetics and is also Director for the Molecular Medicine Program. Interestingly, in addition to all these incredible academic uh, pursuits, he also has another life. He founded and served the, as the Chief Scientific Officer for two biotech companies, Hydra Biosciences in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Navigen Pharmaceutical right here in Salt Lake City. So it won't surprise you that he was my first appointment when I moved here. He is our new Vice Dean for Science and Chief Scientific Officer at the University of Utah. So I'm delighted to introduce to you to him and to hand over the floor to him to, to run tonight's event. So thank you very much. And I'll talk to you a little bit at the very end. So thanks. Any confusion when we sit next to each other is I tell everyone else, there's the real Dean Lee, and then there's just Dean. <laughs> and they go, oh, and I said, there's someone who signs the check and someone who asks for the check. <laughs> and they go, oh, got you. All right. So today, I, I actually was here, I think, was it a year ago or something? I was here a year ago. And one of the things that made me wonder about the format is that what I was wondering is, could we give you, you know, that was me talking for the whole time, and it was like a full course meal. So we're going to try a different sort of eating arrangement, and I would call this either a tapas style or a dim sum style. So we're going to have a bunch of short plates, and we're going to all enjoy those short plates, and then we're going to have some time to digest it and, and be able to ask questions at that time. So we're going to try a little bit of a different format, um, and we'll see how that works. And I would like to start with the first one, which is Michael Varner, who will be talking about getting personal about healthcare. And he's been leading our personalized medicine initiative. Uh, I, I've, I've accumulated embarrassing uh, stories for each person that I would introduce them. But, but Michael Varner, one of his, his uh, passions is music. Uh, he actually told me that he could play or can play the flight of the bumblebee on, uh, on a tuba. And I told him I'd like, I, I'd like to see that. But, but what was actually most interesting is the thing that he likes to do is he likes to listen to opera and he likes to write the score for a piano version of it, which I sit there and i like, okay, that's pretty intense. So uh, uh, I'd like to introduce Michael Varner and he'll give us a tour through the sort of personalized medicine uh, initiative that we have at the University of Utah. Michael. This is an avalanche uh, on uh, Mount Tempanogos, and um, we at least believe that the uh, healthcare system in our country is uh, on its way towards a uh, avalanche of, frankly, epic proportion unless uh, some uh, substantial changes are made uh, real soon. There's a number of things that are uh, afoot here. Certainly chronic disease is one of them. All of us know people with chronic diseases. Truth be known, half of all U.S. adults now have at least one chronic disease. 
and you'll be hearing a little bit more about uh, a couple of those, diabetes and heart failure, in uh, just a moment. Healthcare costs are, are unsustainable. What was a mere $250 billion enterprise, the U.S. healthcare system, uh, 30 years ago is now $2.7 trillion. Uh, um, the U.S. healthcare system, just in and of itself, is the fifth largest economy in the world, uh, and a third of that is, frankly, unnecessary or inappropriate uh, interventions. And even if we could lop that whole third off, we'd still be the eighth largest economy uh, in the world. Um, Having said all that, uh, there's clearly uh, a number of, uh, of dramatic changes uh, that are at or even uh, on the horizon. Uh, healthcare policy, payments, regulatory policies, et cetera. And then last but not least is uh, big data. And this is, uh, turns out is really big data that uh, um, you know, we as a species will generate uh, 2.7 zettabytes, I never heard of a zettabyte before, of data in calendar 2012. Zettabyte is you take one and then you put 21 zeros after it, that's a, uh, that gets you a zettabyte. Uh, a way to think about that is that that's 174 newspapers per person per day for every person on the planet. Uh, and that data is increasing by 50% a year. So next year, you're going to have to read 216 newspapers every day to uh, just keep up with everything that's coming. Truth of the matter is no physician, not even my colleagues up here, can keep up with that amount of, of, uh, uh, of data. So uh, the Utah Avalanche uh, uh, Center says that the best way to not die in an avalanche is not to not be in one. So what we hope we're going to do is at least is come up with some safe, smart, and uh, efficient ways to get down the mountain. Our uh, personalized healthcare mission is to enhance life uh, and health through top quality, top value, individualized care that's uh, enabled by scientific discovery and innovative healthcare delivery. Uh, what that basically means is tailoring uh, care to the individual characteristics of each person. That's a whole bunch of different things, uh, genetics, environment, uh, medical, family, and life uh, histories, gender, culture, personal preferences, all sorts of uh, things. So. So uh, why Utah anyway? And uh, University of Utah is a uh, truly integrated academic medical center. We're in a unique setting and have a whole bunch of one-of-a-kind uh, assets. Uh, we're home to large families. I'm an obstetrician, so it's job security for me, uh, <laughs> who, are, who are quite willing to participate in meaningful research. While we are geographically isolated, we play well with our neighbors, uh, Intermountain Healthcare and the VA in uh, particular. And we also have a tradition of uh, foresightful faculty and uh, administrators. And um, Mario Capecchi, who's one of our faculty colleagues, was mentioned uh, a moment ago, but uh, he, he had this quote uh, from a talk he had to give in Stockholm a few years ago that uh, um, in Utah you can see for long distances and that um, that influences the way you think. Once you move out west, and if you then go back east, you notice it, um, and you do. Uh, another of our uh, unique legacies was uh, establishment 30-plus years ago now of the uh, Utah Population Database. turns out there is nothing like this anywhere else uh, on the planet. Um, it's, it's the UPD, UP, UPDB ha has linked thousands of Utah family pedigrees, many of which are eight to ten generations now, uh, with medical and uh, demographic uh, information. This uh, particular family photo here is from 1890. Uh, there's, a, there's a pointer under here. Uh, father, mother, and then uh, nine of their 12 uh, kids in this uh, picture. Um, and as of a couple of months ago, uh, mom and dad had, have had 6,050 descendants, 5,422 of whom are still living. So uh, I challenge anybody anywhere else to uh, match that. So these linkages are being used uh, certainly to identify uh, genetic and environmental causes uh, of disease and also to develop uh, decision support algorithms to, to predict disease, uh, to develop individualized uh, and effective diagnostics and treatments. One example of that is uh, pharmacogenomics. Which, uh, which means using genetic information along with all those other things to, to determine for each individual the right medication uh, and the right amount at the right time, at the point of care, and at the right cost. 
Uh, I have to tell you, we're developing some what I think are really cool technologies that'll be able to do genetic testing in 15 to 20 minutes uh, with a saliva sample uh, and a, a gadget attached just to a, uh, a laptop computer, which I think is really going to uh, going to be a game changer for uh, uh, this whole personalized healthcare business. Um, personalized healthcare, uh, though, it really is a team effort. Um, I can't read through all of the uh, the uh, the listings here, but uh, I would. Uh, uh, draw particular attention to the College of Pharmacy, which has uh, historically been uh, ranked in the top 10 in the United States and year in and year out is in the top three in terms of uh, research funding. So we think we're all in this together, and all of us is literally all of us. Um, but we at the University of Utah are all pledged to collaborate and to do our individual parts to move personalized health care forward. And uh, Thank you all for uh, coming tonight, and I'll pass it back to Dean. So the next speaker uh, will be uh, Andy, Andy Weirich, uh, who's a professor of medicine. And uh, again, I will tell you probably not such an embarrassing story about him. So he's a real athlete. He was an All-American, and his entry into science was studying bat speed and whether aluminum bats and wood bats and, and the dynamics associated with this. Um, and he still tries to relive uh, those glory days uh, <clears throat> with his son, and they play in the Park City Abilities League here. Um, and uh, he'll be talking about his research in terms of uh, in terms of platelets and clotting and their importance for stroke, diabetes, and heart disease. Andy, this is my son, and he's in he's in the Miracle League. Baseball, which is actually Park City based, and uh, he's a Dodger, and that's been actually tough for me. I apologize to anybody who's a Dodger fan, but I was born in Ohio in the heartland, and I grew up with the big red machine, which is Cincinnati, and we bleed red. And so it's been difficult for me to transition into Dodger blue, and just to make the wound a little bit deeper, uh, my wife and my son and my daughter this week got me the Dodger jersey and the Dodger hat <laughs> and opening day is this Saturday and so we are going to play and I am going to have to go and be in Dodger blue so and you can imagine um, that it's a lot of fun to do this right and it's actually really rewarding and that's what I love about my job because I go in today I go in every single day and I get to work with this great group of uh, researchers, both at the basic science, the bench, and the bedside level. And we get to study blood clotting. And it's fabulous. And it's super rewarding, just like this is um, for me. And we study a, a blood clotting. And we've actually made some really great discoveries in this. And, and, and there's a cell that's really, really important for blood clotting. It's called the platelet. And some of you may know that, some of you may not, but it's the smallest cell in the human body. But you've all encountered it, because if you cut yourself, a platelet is the first responder that gets there, it gets to the wound, and it stops the bleeding, right? And so most times, platelets are good. But in disease situations, and a lot of disease situations, and ones that you're going to hear tonight, the platelet kind of turns bad. It starts to behave badly. And in diseases such as diabetes, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, the platelet becomes hyperreactive, and it starts to clot sometimes when it's not supposed to. Um, in heart failure and in heart disorders like atrial fibrillation, um, again, platelets become hyperactive, and they become prone to clot. In vascular diseases like high blood cholesterol um, and atherosclerosis, again, the platelet is kind of prone to clot, and it's very susceptible. And even in you and I, as we age, we begin to see changes in platelets that actually make us more prone to actually maybe throw a blood clot abnormally, which in, in, and at the end of the day, that's not so great. And it happens both in male and females. And the number one killer in the United States and, and worldwide is cardiovascular disease. And at the heart of that, the thing that actually the culprit is really the platelet um, when it really comes down to it. And why is that? And so we'll show you a little movie here of a platelet and a clot. So essentially this is a within, if you can take yourself within the heart or within a cerebral or in the brain vessel, and you have these, uh, in the case of a heart, you have arteries that surround it. And if you look inside of that, if this was a coronary artery, this is actually a coronary vessel, 
And this is an atherosclerotic plaque, which actually can grow and get big, and it can rupture, and then you're prone to actually have a clot. And then eventually what happens is these little cells, they come in, and they throw this, and they, they throw a clot, and they stop blood flow. If you stop blood flow, then you're really susceptible to a heart, a stroke, and an angi- angina for some of you, and you don't have that because you uh, don't actually get a, uh, a heart attack at that point, but then you can get one. And so anyway, the, the platelet is kind of a primary player there. And the thing that's interesting for platelets were discovered over 100 years ago, and everybody thought that a platelet was a pla- is a platelet is a platelet. It's a, and every individual, it acts exactly the same, and it clots exactly the same. And the reality is, is what we've found over the last 10 years is it's really not the case. Platelets are actually very different, and they're very personalized. And, and somebody who has diabetes versus somebody who has cardiovascular disease, the platelet may be hyperreactive and react completely differently. But why did people actually think that platelets were kind of not that smart, so to speak? Um, And the reason why is because they're not only the smallest cell, but they're one of the few cells that circulate that doesn't have a nucleus. And so what do I mean by that? So if you take a white blood cell as an example, a white blood cell has a nucleus, and it's kind of a command center or a brain center, and it actually has DNA. And that DNA gives it a genetic code, and it kind of tells the white blood cell what to be. And so in the case of a white blood cell, it regulates inflammation. The same thing with a cardiac muscle cell. They actually have nuclei, which have DNA and a genetic code, which tell the heart muscles to contract when they need to, to slow down, to speed up when they need to. And that also occurs in a nerve cell, and it also occurs even in a fat cell. They have a nucleus. Um, But the platelet doesn't have one. You know, and so if a playlist is not that smart, it's kind of like a sack of glue. It's just sticky, you know, and gets there. And the reality is that's really not the case. And sometimes I think of the platelet as like the scarecrow in the Wizard of Oz. I mean, the scarecrow doesn't have a brain right, but the scarecrow is pretty daggone smart and ends up, you know, leading everybody through Oz. And platelet doesn't have a nucleus, but it's actually very, very smart. And in fact, it does have a genetic code. And so what we've done is shown that. And we've teamed up with a bench-to-bedside approach, and it's worked phenomenally well. So Matt Rondine over here runs our thrombosis care service at the University of Utah. So if any of you presented with a venous thrombosis or you had some kind of clotting disorder or a platelet thing, you would actually come see Matt. And he and I work together with others in our group, and we enroll people with with bleeding problems, with clotting disorders, but we also enroll people with cardiovascular disease and diabetes, and we study their platelets. And what you can see inside of each one of these platelets is actually a genetic code. They have like thousands of things that they actually code, and it gives the platelet kind of its behavior. It actually gives it its personality, so to speak. And all of you have this. And it's a little bit different from all of you. But the thing that's really interesting is if you have cardiovascular disease, diabetes, or as you get older, or male and female, and heart failure, what you see is that this genetic code, all of these things, they actually flip, and they kind of turn upside down. And then what happens is that the platelet begins to exhibit a different behavior. And sure enough... They give little tentacles. The platelet actually gets very sticky, and it adheres where it's not supposed to adhere, and it does things it's not supposed to do. And this just shows the platelet as it's going through this when it has this abnormal genetic code. And in addition to sticking to surfaces like plaques that it shouldn't, the platelet also attracts white blood cells, so it regulates inflammation in a way that you wouldn't expect it to. It brings in other platelets, and then it can induce clotting. And then really what happens is, is that these clots can then embed themselves inside of our vessels. They can actually stop blood flow, leading to heart attacks and stroke. But because they have white blood cells, they can regulate inflammation. And then they can also regulate long-term processes like the development of plaques. And so our goal is to use this bench-to-bedside approach where we look at... uh, all different types of patients that we actually bring in that that Matt recruits, people with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, heart failure, you name it, and we want to characterize this genetic code to see why their platelet is different in each one of these disease states. And by doing that, we know, and we've already had some examples where we can actually improve some of the current therapies that are out there, some that all of us may be on, like aspirin or Plavix, and some people respond well, 
and others don't, and we hope to be able to identify those that do and don't and actually make them respond better to current therapies. But we've also, because we've identified so many new novel things, we have all these molecular targets that we can now go after. So maybe we'll be able to develop an antiplatelet drug that can treat a patient in diabetes versus cardiovascular disease in combination with what we have currently. But we're not just about therapies. We're also into lifestyle modifications. In fact, we have actually have data both in mice and men and with uh, Dale Abel that we've worked with to show that weight loss actually can reverse this partly by itself. So just lifestyle modifications may make the platelet better. And at the end of the day, what our plan is actually to have this platelet that's actually sticky actually turn and revert itself back to its normal place where it can be round and flow freely. Thank you very much for your time and attention. You know, I was debating as to how to introduce Diana. Uh, so I was going to start by saying that I actually just uh, was recently on service. And one of the things that when we are on service, let's say at the VA, the teams that we are, have are filled with medicine doctors, cardiologists, pharmacists, uh, nurses, and, and that's how we interact on the clinical service. And what we wanted to bring out from the research standpoint is the same sort of uh, synergies that everyone brings to each other. What Diana does is something that us doctors don't always realize, which is how to really think about the cost effectiveness of exactly what you're doing, how to make it so that we magnify that cost effectiveness or reduce the risk associated with this, and to include the fact that there is an economic price paid by this country every time doctors decide to do something. Diana? In the next five minutes, I'm going to be sharing with you how we can evaluate outcomes and costs of personalized medicine. So in that regard, first, let's review the promise of personalized medicine and how pharmacogenomic testing can be used in evaluating the appropriate treatment for disease. Throughout my talk tonight, I'm going to look at a population of patients with breast cancer that are in stage two, which generally means they've undergone a initial surgery and now are considering whether they should go through chemotherapy or not to prevent any recurrences. So in this regard, genetic testing can be used in two ways. One, in order to stratify the patients as to whether they should receive treatment or not based on their potential risk of relapse or reoccurrence. And secondly, genetic tests can also be used to stratify patients to predict what treatment would bring the best response. However, we need to recognize, as Dean stated, that these tests come at a cost. So we need to weigh what these additional costs might be against the benefit they could bring to these patients. So in order to do that, to predict what the added benefit would be of a new way of treatment with genetic testing, we need to really understand what is the standard of care today. So what are we building on with these new genetic tests? So in order to develop what standards of care are, at the Pharmacotherapy Outcomes Research Center in the College of Pharmacy, we develop what we're calling patient-centered research registries, which are populations of patients where we can study how the standard of care of treatment is today. We have various different disease states where we've created these types of research registries, but again today, we're going to focus on such a group in breast cancer. By looking at various different electronic medical records, the Utah Population Database that Dr. Varner referred to, we can actually group patients within our healthcare system with breast cancer that have been confirmed in a tumor registry, and then we can stage these individuals by the severity of their disease. So by applying this process in breast cancer, we determined that we had about 1,220 breast cancer patients at the University of Utah over about 15 years that were in this stage two, trying to make that decision of whether they should have chemotherapy or not. So now we want to look at, well, what were the outcomes and the costs in that cohort of patients? What was the standard of care? Well, in order to look at the outcomes, primarily we'll look at survival. This is a wonderful benefit of the Utah Population Database. It contains all of the death certificates of the population in Utah, so we can actually assess survival of this breast cancer cohort. 
As you can see in this slide, if you look at these stage two individuals in the red line here, we can see that the predicted five-year survival is about 87% today in breast cancer patients in stage two. We'd also like to know, well, how much do we spend on that group of individuals? So we can also look at what are the collective charges, both cancer-related and non-cancer-related, for that stage two breast cancer cohort. So again, we see by this slide that we're spending about $25,000 per year for breast cancer stage two individuals. So with all of this information now, we have the pieces that we need in order to evaluate the cost versus outcomes of introducing genetic testing. Let's take a hypothetical group of 100 of these breast cancer women that have had surgery and are looking at making a decision. In the absence of testing, in other words, our standard of care, we would go through this arm and you see if they're not tested, there will be no cost involved. And by just doing a simple risk profile assessment, in the standard of care, about 75 of those 100 women would be exposed to chemotherapy to prevent recurrence and essentially target for a 90% five-year survival. At $10,000 for 75 of the 100 patients on average, we'd be spending about $7,500 per patient. But now let's look at our new scenario. Look at this scenario where we use genetic testing to help guide what patients will benefit the most from chemotherapy. Because we're using the test, we can now clearly define the 40 of the 100 women that will benefit from the chemotherapy. So now we're only spending $10,000 for the chemotherapy for the 40 that will receive it, but now we need to recognize that we tested all 100 women to determine which were the 40 that benefited. So now if you look at this, you take the chemotherapy, you take the cost of testing everyone, you see we ended up with spending $8,100 per patient in the testing scenario. So this kind of information is very valuable to help determining the value of genetic testing for healthcare providers, for researchers, for those that pay for healthcare, and also for patients, as patients now are also often taking on the burden of paying for some of their own care. If we look at this example, we can see that in the standard care group, the advantage is, or the advantage in the tested group, is that 35 of the women that actually received unnecessary chemotherapy would not be exposed to the adverse and negative effects of chemotherapy in the group that was tested. This has the potential to perhaps improve survival, but in particular, the adverse events that are avoided will now improve the quality of life for that group of patients. So in the end, the question we all ask ourselves, is the additional quality of life, the possible survival benefit, worth the $600 per patient. The thing about the research we do, it doesn't give you the answer. But what it does do is it gives you a format and a layout in which to think about the different trade-offs between the benefits and outcomes and the costs to make judgment decisions on the value of personalized medicine. Thank you. So uh, I was going to next introduce Dale Abo. And he's going to have a bunch of slides. And Dale is someone I've known probably here the longest. And I should also probably say that Vivian knows him the longest because they spend time together at Oxford. Is that, is that correct? So I was going to do something that was PG, but I'm not going to do something <laughs> PG. So my daughter is his age. I mean, his son's age. And I should say, my daughter is his son's age. And the other day I walked into my house, and there were some girls from from Roland Hall, and my, my daughter goes to Skyline. And they were trying to show who the cutest guys from each of their school was. And out pops a picture of Dale Abel's son. And I just said, that is way too creepy for me. <laughs> <laughs> so with no, my, my, no further introduction, but to say that what Dale does is understand and studies diabetes, which is really the next epidemic for us in Utah. Dale. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, I had absolutely no idea what Dean was going to say. Um, 
but I think I had a sixth sense, so you actually see a photograph of my son in my talk, and then you can decide if he's cute or not. Um, but in terms of just giving a little bit about myself, um, in terms of why am I here in, in Utah, so a good question one is always ask is, you know, when you, when you were a kid, um, what did your backyard sort of look like? So I grew up in the tropics, I, I'm from Jamaica, and our backyard kind of looked like that. Um, and you know, there were some things that were really important in life when you sort of went walking outside, sort of, you know, beware of um, falling fruit like mangoes or almonds. Um, so my backyard now kind of looks like this. Well, sorry, this is, this is up at Alta. Um, but this is my backyard. This is our dog. Um, not this winter, but a previous winter. And you can see him sort of making his way through the snow to do his business. Um, but so... I think one of the interesting things, um, just from a biographical standpoint before I get into what I do scientifically, is this is a picture of um, a fishing village in, in Jamaica. And you can see that there's no electricity and um, no running water. And my grandparents pretty much grew up without electricity or running water. Um, and so from sort of fairly humble um, beginnings, largely through the, the, the value of I guess being a former English colony where education was very highly valued, um, I was fortunate enough to get the best of what we had to offer in Jamaica's education, but also ultimately was able to go to Oxford where I did meet Vivian. Um, We were both Rhodes Scholars together in the same class and um, subsequently moved to Harvard and then came to Utah. So um, that's a little bit of who I am and then Here's a dish. So my son, that's Elliot over there on the right. That's my lovely wife, Jen. Um, that's my daughter, Grace. And that's us having some, um, a therapy visit to the Caribbean. Um, but you can be the judge. But um, again, I did not know what Dean was about to say. But nevertheless, um, our lab and our group studies diabetes. And so what is diabetes? Diabetes is the, is the commonest metabolic disorder worldwide. And... Um, It occurs when there is insufficient insulin that's produced by the body and um, is then not able to effectively act because the tissues in your body become resistant to the effect of insulin. And that describes what we call type 2 diabetes, which really describes 95% of all individuals with diabetes. There's another kind of diabetes called type 1 diabetes in which um, an immune or allergic reaction destroys the, the pancreatic cells that make insulin and so you have absolutely no insulin and then you get diabetes. Is there anyone in this room who doesn't know anybody who has diabetes? You know nobody who has diabetes. Or do you know somebody who has diabetes? Exactly. So I would, I would, I would posit that everybody in here knows at least one person, probably more, who has diabetes. And, um, you know, when you think about diabetes, you oftentimes think, well, you know, it's, it's a disorder of blood sugar. Your, your, your blood sugar is high, so you have diabetes. That is true. But also importantly, diabetes isn't only a disease of high blood sugar. So what this cartoon is showing is that your pancreas makes insulin, and insulin acts on the liver and on the muscle to increase glucose uptake or to reduce glucose production. So it does regulate glucose. But insulin also acts on fat cells. And so what happens in diabetes is that your circulating levels of fats in your body are actually elevated. And so although glucose causes many complications of diabetes, high levels of circulating fat in your body also are responsible for um, many of the complications of diabetes. So our group is very focused on type 2 diabetes, which is the commonest kind of diabetes that, that occurs. And this is a very sort of scary cartoon. So this is from the CDC. And it's showing from 1994 to 2009 the increase in diabetes that has occurred in the United States. So you can see that we are becoming a red nation. This is not a political talk, but you'll notice that there are red states and then there are kind of orange states. And there's this tremendous increase in diabetes. And you notice that that increase tracks with obesity as well. Now... If you look at this map, you say, well, you know, Utah isn't sort of doing so badly because we have kind of retained our orange glow in the middle of this um, reddening nation. Um, But just to put some numbers on that, and it kind of came off the edge here, but there are now currently about 30 million people in the United States with diabetes. 
and 80 million people with prediabetes. So nearly one-third of us are potentially at risk of getting diabetes. But, you know, I said, you know, Utah is not doing too badly, but the question is, is Utah exempt? So my son, who we have now met, came home about two weeks ago with this pizza box from um, a, a store not very far from here, which some of you may know. And I said, look at that. So this was on the pizza box. Um, Fat Kid Pizza, proudly served that shall remain anonymous. Um, and then on the back side of that box, right, was, I guess, the consequence <laughs> of um, eating all this pizza. Now, we are here tonight talking about personalized medicine. And so it says, you know, one size fits all. But we don't believe that because I think that, in fact, this is really the opposite to personalized medicine. Um, but what leads to diabetes? So diabetes occurs really largely through a, a confluence of your genetics. Um, as I mentioned, type 1 diabetes is largely because of autoimmunity, and which is a tremendous amount of genetics that causes that. But there's a big environmental component um, that's linked to obesity, which is also linked with one's um, genetics, which then leads to changes in your ability to secrete insulin or the ability of insulin to act. And you end up with um, diabetes, which then causes your blood sugar to go up, and you end up with complications. So the reason why, to me, as, a, as an endocrinologist, diabetes is scary is because of the complications. So um, what are some of these complications? So um, diabetes is the leading cause of blindness in the United States. We call that diabetic retinopathy. It's the leading cause of dialysis in this country, leading to end-stage renal disease. It causes damage to nerves, so we call that diabetic neuropathy. And importantly, um, diabetes causes cardiovascular disease, so increases the risk of stroke, increases the risk of heart attacks and heart failure. So what our group has, I think, spent the last 10 years working on, and we've kind of gotten famous in that area, is trying to understand what diabetes does to the heart. So we live in Utah, I live in Emigration Canyon, everybody starts cycling up the canyon, so we're very fit, we love to exercise. So the heart, is an exercising muscle. But in contrast to my biceps, and I'm sort of tired lifting weights, I can rest. The heart, unfortunately, doesn't have that option. If it does, then you can't, you're like not here anymore. So, so, so it turns out that in order for the heart to, to keep beating day in, day out, it has to make a lot of energy and use a lot of energy. And the currency of energy in the heart is something called ATP. So that's like the gasoline that keeps the heart running. So believe it or not, in diabetes, um, the heart is actually starved of energy. So this is a person who's a diabetic down here, and they put them in the scanner called a PET scan. Maybe some of you have had PET scans or not, but you can use these scans to measure glucose uptake into the heart. And you can see that this diabetic, in, and compared to this non-diabetic person up here, is their heart is actually using less glucose. And it turns out that diabetics their hearts are energy starved. It's kind of a paradox because there's all the sugar around, but yet their hearts are starved. And the reason why their hearts are starved, and so we have shown this, is that the little batteries in the heart that make ATP called mitochondria are damaged. So this is a very high-powered um, image from an electron microscope of heart muscle from non-diabetic and diabetic. And you know, one doesn't have to be a rocket scientist to say that this looks different from that. That's what a healthy heart looks like. This is what a diabetic heart looks like. You can see the mitochondria, someone like took a, uh, a hair dryer and sort of blew dry, blow dried the mitochondria. And you can see that these are not healthy mitochondria. And in fact, these diabetic hearts are even becoming um, full of fat. So the heart is severely damaged in mitochondria. So how does, what does this have to do with personalized medicine? So I see you in my clinic, and people have two questions. I either see you before you have diabetes, and you said, well, Dr. Abel, what is my risk? of developing diabetes, or you see me and you have diabetes, and, and the question is, well, what is my risk of developing one of those complications which I mentioned to you earlier? So we think that personalized medicine could be a very important key to actually addressing some of those questions. And at the University of Utah, we are, I think, very uniquely poised to address some of those issues. So let me just give you three things that I think we are very good at here on the research front and how that will then ultimately um, impact our ability to, 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 to do personalized care. So we are leaders in understanding the pathways, but that, that is to say, what are some of the earliest changes that occur 
on the road to diabetes because we think that as we understand these, we'll actually know exactly how to create therapies to address those very early changes before they get sort of too set in stone. Similarly, with complications, we um, are understanding now the very early changes or the pathways that lead to complications in the eyes and kidneys. And in fact, um, Dean Lee over here, who didn't say that, but he now has a, a drug which he has discovered that is, in fact, may be the magic bullet for curing diabetic eye disease, for example, because we understood the pathways that led to that. And then, importantly, we need to, um, we're working on ways to, to actually get better blood tests to figure out what's in the blood, not just the sugar or the fat, but other small things that are secreted from mitochondria when they get damaged, which can help to predict um, your risk of disease. So we're very uniquely poised here at the university. We have phenomenal genetics, as I'm sure you've heard many times before. We are now put in place um, machines that can measure hundreds of small molecules in the blood, which we think can now predict disease, and we call these biomarkers. And we now have um, evidence of, and with Dr. Lee being a radiologist, but one of the things in diabetes is how can you image the pancreas to figure out do you have lots of insulin secreting cells or not so many insulin secreting cells? So I think that um, enhanced imaging will allow us again to, to say to somebody, you know, you have 95% of your pancreas is good. You only have 2% left, it's not so good. And so to allow us to stratify people in that way. So the process that we take at the university is very, is very collaborative. Um, we have people in the lab. We have people who would take things from the lab, we call it translational, but you take a discovery in the lab and you move it into testing to see if it will make sense in people. And then, of course, we have patients that we take care of. Um, and so this is a picture of the Diabetes Center um, down in Research Park, which I have the pleasure of running on the clinical side of my life. And um, so all of us interact in a way to go from the laboratory into experiments, and ultimately our goal is to have treatment. Look into the, to the crystal ball, as it were, and if you came to see me in 20 years from now. So we think we're going to have biomarkers, blood tests, specific signatures that will allow us to say to you, what is your risk in a very quantitative way? We'll have, um, because of the increase in knowledge that we have of why it happens, I think we'll have much more um, tailored therapies that we can offer. Um, and we'll have a better way of assessing um, using our usual tools of stethoscopes and taking histories, but also ways to, um, to, to tailor the, te the therapy to very specific um, needs. And finally, um, we can use these markers to predict therapy. So just to put it in summary then, better tests that allow us to be better able to predict your risk, a better understanding of the earliest changes that will occur before diabetes becomes obvious, so we have better therapies, better understanding of the earliest changes that occur before the complications happen, and also a better test that will allow us to predict how you may respond to our therapy. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is actually, one person is going to speak, but I should mention Dr. Stelic, who's actually my father's cardiologist. So I'm bringing you the real doctors who I would send my family to. And then so far, my father doesn't need Dr. Craig Salzman yet, who is the CT surgeon. And uh, Craig, Craig actually has a great love for outdoors. He went to medical school uh, and did much of his training, um, did much of his training in Colorado. And his wife, sometimes there's a, I would say a love-hate relationship between cardiologists and CT surgeons, as you might understand. But, but Craig is actually married to one of my cardiology uh, uh, colleagues, Kim Salzman. So they have a not so much of a love-hate relationship, uh, or at least I hope. And uh, with no further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Salzman, who I think you guys might have remembered that we did the Jarvik Heart here. And actually, there's a quiet revolution going on right now. 28 miles away from here. Craig. I don't know how to respond to the wife thing. You know, uh, when we were married, <laughs> we had to meet. So I'm one of the, one of the Jews here in Utah. So uh, we had to meet with our rabbi. And I'm a bad Jew. So uh, she's a good Jew. I'm a bad Jew. Uh, so we met with a rabbi. And, you know, and we're under the chuppah. I don't know if anybody's there's just a little thing. You're under a chuppah and they're... The rabbi's going, and he just couldn't not stand the fact 
that we were heart physicians. And so I'm probably the only one that either wanted to hit their rabbi slash priest slash judge slash whatever during the wedding. So I'm glad you're over there because I can't reach you. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, everybody thinks we go home and say, hey, honey, how's the heart? Oh, it was good, honey. How's the heart for you? We don't do that. We don't do that. So uh, we have other things to talk about. Anyway, what I'm here to talk about is uh, bad hearts. And, um, and there are a lot of bad hearts out there. Uh, about 6 million people out there have heart failure. And within that group, there's about 500,000 every year that are newly diagnosed with heart failure. And within this group, there's a smaller subset that have very advanced forms of heart failure. These are patients that they come and they talk to us. And I, one of the first questions I ask when, in clinic, and I say, where did you park? And they said, uh, well, valet parking. I said, okay. Well, valet parking is at the front of the hospital. And to our clinic, we haven't quite measured it out, but it's, it's several hundred feet. I said, how many times did you stop on the way to the clinic? And if they made it to the clinic, I said, well, you don't have advanced heart failure. If you stopped at the Starbucks not to get coffee but to sit down, then you have bad heart failure. So some of these patients really have trouble getting out of bed, going to the refrigerator, going to the mailbox. These patients, they get short of breath, very fatigued. These have advanced heart failure. And this is a huge socioeconomic impact for us. You know, almost... $30 billion. We're talking about people that are unable to go to work, people that are being admitted to the hospital every other month for things, big-time drug utilization, big-time device utilizations. I'm a big problem as a surgeon. I, I impact this uh, significantly. What do we do for it? Well, typically medical therapy is the most common. I'm sure there's somebody in this audience that's probably taking a pill that ends with prill, enalapril, lisinopril. Yeah, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands, but those are the kind of drugs that we use typically in the medical armamentarium to, to do this. But if you have patients that have very advanced forms, sometimes all that we can do is heart transplantation. And so this is a, a, a bad heart on the, on the left. It's a big, big heart, and we take that big heart out, and we put in a nice heart that can pump better. But the problem is we only do about 2,500 of these a year. So you can see the disconnect. There's about 800,000 patients... That's probably a little bit too aggressive. Let's say there's about 200,000 patients a year that could maybe benefit from a heart transplant, but because of donors, not enough people riding motorcycles without their helmets on, um, there's only about 2,500 patients. And so what have we done before that? So in order to try to help these patients that are very sick, there's been an evolution, revolution, whatever you want to call it, to put in artificial hearts. What this is a di diagram of is what we call a left ventricular assist device. So this is a picture of a heart. This is the failing pumping chamber, the main pumping chamber, the left ventricle. We stick a tube into it. It goes to a motor that spins the blood and sends it out to the rest of the body. This thing requires power. So what you see here is an electrical cord that comes out of the side. Now, a lot of times we use these devices, for the most part, to go ahead and transplant these patients when they get a little bit sicker. Other groups of patients we put in and maybe they're not candidates for transplant. Maybe it's a 75-year-old that's not really, we're not going to use one of these 2,500 hearts on that. We're going to put it in. That's going to be their therapy for their advanced heart failure. And then what we're particularly interested in is not so much about getting this thing in, but, geez, can we get this heart better and actually get the thing out? So there's been a big evolution in this. In, in this uh, the heart pump technology started back in the 1960s with Dr. DeBakey and things like that. Modern era was probably in the 1990s, these big pumps. This is a chest x-ray. The lungs are what are black. This is the big heart. There's a big machine in the middle of this thing. This is what you would want if you were on the south side of Chicago because you couldn't be hurt if somebody attacked you with this <laughs> thing. So, but what's come now is that instead of this thing that weighs about three or four or five pounds, patients, you have a small patient, this, this, this was heavy. Now we put these things in that are, are ounces and fit in the palm of your hand. This is what we do. These are the kind of things that we do now. And obviously, there's also been an evolution in, in the other components. We used to have, this is, a, this is a console that used to provide power. We used to have patients walk through the hospital pushing this. We call this the Zamboni machine, pushing the Zamboni machine down the hallway. Now we have one of our most famous LVAD patients who recently was transplanted. Uh, again, as uh, Dr. Abel said, this is not a political discussion here today. Um, but anyway, this is the battery that is used. So instead of pushing this big old thing down the hallway, someone like Dick Cheney or whoever can actually go home and, and, and walk 18 holes of golf, you name it, they can do it. 
So the University of Utah, we've been involved with this for a long time. I haven't been here this whole time, but back in the early 1980s, in the early 80s, this is a picture taken right out of the, uh, the hallways of our hospital. This is Barney Clark, a dentist who was the first recipient of the Total Artificial Heart uh, back in 1981. There was another one that was on the second patient, made it on the cover of Life magazine. That was a while ago. And this is what we're doing right now. This is a patient that currently is existing with a pump that was developed by the University of Utah here in Salt Lake City. It was a second uh, 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 group of patients placed in the United States. This is actually a picture of our, uh, our lady but, uh, that's one of our longest uh, patients. She's, now, she's almost four years out living with her pump up in, uh, up in Idaho. And indeed, we've made a big impact. Our, kind of, our current team came together uh, in the, about three years ago. We used to put in about five or ten of these things, and now we're putting in about 60 of these things. And so this is a therapy that's going, 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 going. In order to do this, we have a huge team. This is our org chart. A lot of you guys come from businesses that have org charts. This is our org chart. Myself and Dr. Stelic over here, we kind of help manage this wrangly group of people, all put together to try to help one patient that has one of these machines in. We have a broad geographic area where we have these patients. They, the, the red things that you see here are where actually some of our patients live. They live as far as off in Georgia, up in Wisconsin, California, Texas, obviously in our region here. The blue dots are places where we've gone and actually trained facilities. So this is really an important part of, of the University of Utah interacting, not just locally, but regionally, nationally as well. I'm going to just give a quick background. This is a patient. Unfortunately, uh, he has since passed away. But an example of how we try to use personalized medicine. This is a patient. He's in his mid-50s. He has multiple sclerosis. Excuse me, muscular dystrophy. Because of his muscular dystrophy, he's unable to walk. He had a terrible heart as, as a result of that. And the only thing that he could do was swim. So I just told you that you have to have an electrical cord come out with this thing. So that's probably not a good idea. We don't go take showers with our hair dryer. And, and so what we did with him is uh, we used some technology that we knew that existed over in Europe, and we brought it over here for this patient. FDA had to let us do this. And so we implanted this thing so that he could go swimming. Because when we talked to him beforehand, and he was really sick, he wasn't going to last much longer. He said, what do you want out of life? And he said, I want to swim. And so this is a video of him going for his first swim. I've never gone in the pool with my LVAD. I'm excited. <laughs> a little bit scared, but I'll be all right. <laughs> I've been waiting for this day for a long time. It's all implanted in my skull, and then the wires go down and into my heart pump. So we just got to keep the, um, this unit here, the battery, dry. And yeah, I take a shower every day. A skull implants a titanium plate that the cables are connected to, and there's six titanium screws that screw right into the skull. So there's no open sore, it's all healed. So the infection won't happen here and the water won't get in. Baby, it's cold. <laughs> this guy's brave, right? First time he's been down the street uh, from the university we used to take uh, the tracks up go to the JC sites right next to the university he owns self grab the side yeah. about 10 more feet alright the chairs there the chair. keep going about 3 more feet you're up here you okay yeah. What do you need? Oh, I just got a little out of breath there. <laughs> it's kind of different. I just got to remember to breathe. <laughs> That's good. So anyway, uh, he's a, he was a fantastic man. He, he passed for uh, some other reasons, but uh, this is an example. And, and we got a lot of great stories out there. We got old folks. We got younger folks. We got kids. All of them have good stories. But the, the, the more interesting story for us... Obviously, doing these things and helping patients is great. But putting the pumps in is, is good. But what we want to do now is we want to get the doggone things out. And so how are we going to do that? 
Well, what we identified is that there's a series of patients, and this is a, one of those ultrasounds. Just like you were going to have a baby, they put the little ultrasound probe. This is over the heart. This is called an echocardiogram. And, and what you want to see is you want to see this heart squeezing. Hopefully all of our hearts are going boom, 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 boom. This is a patient that before we put in one of these artificial hearts, you can kind of see it's really not doing much. It's just kind of quivering. About six months later, this is the same patient, and you can see how much better it's contracting. This patient, had heart has gotten better on the pump. And what we've identified is that about 20% of all of our patients on these pumps actually get better. And it's not just a little bit. We're talking big time, 50 to 300% better. I mean, this is huge. This is, this is, you don't see this kind of stuff. You see papers in the New England Journal of Medicine or somebody talk about something on CNN and where they say, we gave this fancy stem cell and they made this heart much better. Those kind of betters are 3%, 4%, 5%. We're talking 300% betters. This is an observation that we need to understand better. And that's what we're trying to do. So we have this big group of people that are trying to do exactly what we've all been talking about, Obser making observations about humans in, 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 in the clinics, going back to the lab and trying to figure it out. So what do we see in the lab? This is a patient when we look at their heart muscle at the time of the implant. Don't worry about all this junk. This looks bad, right? This looks like something that you would put on your kitchen floor, right? A few, few months later, when we go and transplant this heart, after this heart, same patient, this is the same patient, we look at the heart muscle. Trust me, this looks normal, okay? It looks normal. And all of a sudden we see that there's other, some new cells that we hadn't seen before. Where do these things come from? Are these new muscle cells? It turns out that regeneration is just one of the many things. What we're trying to do is identify, is there a signature or is there a pattern with patients that get better versus that don't? And this is how we are attacking personalized medicine with this particular patient population. So in summary, what we're trying to do with our advanced heart failure program, with these machines, with transplantation, is to take patients that are getting these artificial hearts and try to attack the paradigm that a bad heart can't get better. We think that it can. We think that we can understand it, that we can identify very specific things about a single patient that might make that patient get better, whereas another one might not get better. And then we would know, well, hey, maybe that's the patient that that's going to have that LVAD in for the rest of their life. Maybe this other one is going to be different, and maybe we can get the pump out. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, final uh, speaker is Catherine Degree, and I should actually just tell you that today has been a celebration for her. She won the Martha Hughes Cannon Award from the Utah Public Health Association because of her pioneer work on women and children's health. And Kathleen... Great to have you here. Thank you so much. Well, we're going to kind of change the tables a little bit and come to uh, real life. I'm from the Center of Excellence in Women's Health, where we believe that personalized medicine is extremely important, but it's more than our genes. We subscribe to the seven domains of health. A woman's health is much more than the body parts because for balance and wellness, we need to have everything else in balance. And this means that our, our physical health has to be good, our social health, emotional health, intellectual health, environmental health, financial health, and spiritual health have to all be in balance for an individual to be healthy. And just as personalized medicine is looking at our genes and our genome and everything, we are very interested in trying to integrate uh, our, our, our seven domains of health because we realize that this also is as different for each individual uh, as our genetic makeup. Now, there are three epochs in a woman's life that are extremely important. And the first one is adolescence. And you could imagine that if you could analyze an adolescent, understand their domains of health, if you will, as well as where they are physically, we could launch this young woman into adulthood with a healthy attitude and healthy outcome. The second epic that is really important is during our, our period of reproduction. So women who are pregnant or postpartum and we are learning that post, uh, the pregnant woman is a sort of a window 
for women's health down the, down the line. And that at the postpartum time period, it's extremely important for a woman to, to gain health, healthy information, lose the weight after having a baby so that a woman doesn't have chronic conditions later on. But the third epoch, the midlife, a woman who ent- enters into midlife is ex- especially challenging because not only is the body changing, the whole social construct is changing, our minds are changing. And so for this reason, uh, the Center of Excellence in Women's Health has launched a midlife women's health assessment clinic. And this clinic has three parts. Before the visit even occurs, we ask women to fill out an extensive questionnaire and do appropriate screenings. Now, the questionnaire cause covers many, many different screenings for different types of conditions and tries to uh, find out what the risk factors for that individual is. And we have the appropriate screenings for blood work as well as mammography. This, at, at the visit, uh, the woman is served a light lunch, and attention is drawn to what is the roadmap for the rest, the next phase of a woman's life. What are the concerns that uh, she uh, no doubt has, and tries to address, we try to address these concerns uh, during this lunch. The woman meets with a gynecologist, an internist, dermatology, hearing, nutrition, and we discuss the findings that have been found on the screening evaluation uh, and the screening blood tests that have been done. We give vaccinations when necessary, and each woman meets with a wellness coach to try to individualize a plan to improve one's health, either exercise or diet or emotional well-being. And then we have a relaxing closing. The visit isn't really finished uh, until after the visit occurs where women are have a complete assessment sent to the primary care physician and as well as the patient and outlines the plans that they that the team has come up with for each individual woman and then makes referrals where necessary if there's a health problem that's found. So you might ask yourself, when you personalize medicine like this in a health assessment clinic, in women two-thirds of whom have already had some kind of preventive care in the last two years, what are the findings? And I'm going to tell you what our findings are in the last two years. First, we found that women in midlife have a lot of significant symptoms like pain, lack of sleep, menopausal symptoms, troubles with memory, decreased libido. Furthermore, we we startlingly found 87% had a new diagnosis, uh, either a skin diagnosis, hearing diagnosis, vitamin D deficiency, but Importantly, some very serious diagnoses were discovered, melanoma, breast cancer, and even a case of cardiomegaly. What was even more startling was that almost universally, every single woman had a risk factor for cardiac disease. And yet, those women weren't counseled that, number one, they had a risk factor. Number two, what could they do to prevent the development of cardiovascular disease or diabetes? And what we really found was that women were satisfied uh, with this clinic. One woman wrote, Thank you so much for a wonderful experience at the Midlife Assessment Clinic. I came away with a renewed sense of self and energy to maintain my physical, mental, and spiritual health. So at the Center of Excellence in Women's Health, we are trying to personalize medicine for women across the lifespan, utilizing our understanding of family history and whatever tests that we need to do for preventive medicine, but also trying to pay attention to those seven domains of health that have the same effect on a person's uh, health. And in doing so, we hope to connect women to wellness. Thanks. So I I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, First, I wanted to thank and acknowledge Mike Varner and Jennifer Logan for their extraordinary leadership in the effort in personalized medicine. Thank Dean Lee and all the speakers for doing such a wonderful job tonight. And I want to thank you all for coming. We are really excited about this new direction that we're taking at the Health Science and Personalized Medicine. We are actually looking to put together an advisory committee to help support our effort to, you know, one of the things as as maybe you might have gotten from um, hearing Kathleen's talk is 
that personalized medicine is about making it personal. And part of being able to design the best personalized medicine, personalized healthcare program is to have the input from the people that we're actually looking to try to care for. And so in this role, as members of the advisory committee, we're really looking for people who can give us some good advice about how we think about our personalized health care program, um, as well as help support us as we try to spread the word and, and encourage people to, to come and help our efforts. So, for example, we would hope that members of our advisory committee might host events, for example, in their home where we could bring some of the scientists and, and physicians along and you could introduce us to your friends and we could try to uh, raise some funds around this program. That, that's the kind of thing we're looking for in, in an advisory committee. So any of you who have found any of this particularly engaging or who might be interested in helping us in that, please feel free to, to let one of us know because we'd, we'd love to have your involvement. Uh, we are really delighted to be a part of the University of Utah. As Mark suggested, we were ranked number one in quality and, and uh, quality and accountability among all the academic medical centers in the country. And I can attest that that is a very difficult position to, to uh, actually attain. In the year that the University of Utah was number one, NYU, my former stomping grounds, was number 10. We were the only academic medical center in New York City that was in the top 10, so we beat out Memorial Sloan Kettering, Columbia, Cornell, you know, all the other programs. We had it on all the bus stops and all the banners everywhere, all the billboards, and every time I saw that list, I saw the University of Utah number one. So it's really a remarkable achievement, a remarkable healthcare organization, and we're just delighted now to take it to the next level by bringing this science uh, for the benefit of our patients. So I want to just thank you all again tonight for coming, and we will look forward to getting to know you all better. So thanks.